Good to see this number out this morning. If you're visiting with us, we consider you an honored guest. I encourage you to take your Bible and study along with us. I have no intention of belittling anything you might believe, and yet have the responsibility of preaching what I find to be true. If I state anything incorrectly, if you'll draw it to my attention, I'll make the proper correction. And it could be that in our study there may be some things we disagree over, but we can disagree without being disagreeable and continue to search the Scripture so that we have the truth and can apply it. A few moments, we'll stand and sing the song that's been suggested. If you've never been baptized in Christ, all things have been made convenient. If you'd make your way to the front, we'd assist you to be baptized and immersed into Christ for the remission of sins or to be restored if that be your need. If you have your Bible, if you'll turn with me to the Ephesian letter and the first chapter, I want to read two verses that Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1. I want to read with you verses 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. A few Sunday mornings ago, we began a series on what is the church of Christ. And the first question we looked at is just exactly who is the church. And we identified the church as the called out people. People who've left the world, who've come to Christ, and they've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. They've been forgiven of their sin and justified, and they live in the body of Christ as the family of God. And we observed that Christ had removed the sin when we were baptized into him, and that our, we were added to the family of God, which is the church. Then this Lord's Day morning, I thought we need to give careful attention to something else. We need to look at just who is exactly the head of the church. Just who has the authority of the church Jesus said he would build in Matthew 16, 18? There's been a lot of misunderstanding about who the head truly is. And many times there's even been some misunderstanding of what the church really is amongst members. I know that when I first became a member of the Lord's church, my view of the church is much different than my view is now that I see from Scripture. So as we think about who is the head of the church, we need to examine what the divine revelation says. And if you look in your Bible, in the book of Matthew and the 28th chapter, we'll see just exactly who the head of the church is. Jesus had been crucified and raised from the dead, and he appears to his apostles. And notice it said in verse 18, Jesus spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now look carefully at the statement Jesus made in verse 18 when he said, all authority has been given to me, not just in heaven, but on earth. You know, there are some people that almost hold the view that God has authority in heaven, but someone else has the authority on earth. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said he has all authority, both in heaven and earth. He doesn't have part of it. He doesn't have some of it. He says all authority. Thus, when I look to Christ, I realize he has the right to tell me how to live, to be in his kingdom. He has the right to direct my steps and guide my ways through his word. All authority has been given to him. But that brings up some pictures of the church that reveals Christ as the head. And every picture of the church shows that Jesus is the head. He's the one with authority. He's the master. If you take your Bible, look, if you will, at several of these pictures. Look, if you will, in the book of 1 Timothy and the third chapter. And when you come to 1 Timothy chapter 3, you remember that at this time, Apostle Paul is writing the young preacher Timothy. And notice, if you will, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, what he calls the church. In verse 15, he said, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now notice he compares the church to a household, a family. And notice that's what the people of God are here at Kemper. We are a spiritual family. But who is the head of the family? 
Someone may say, well, the elders. Well, the elders oversee the flock here, but notice what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 3, who the head is. In Hebrews chapter 3, the Hebrew writer tells us that the son is over his house. Look at verse 6. Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. So Christ has oversight of the house. We are the body. He is the head. So then if I take my Bible, I understand that Christ is over the house. But then secondly, there's the picture of the church as a kingdom. And if you look in your Bible in the book of John and the third chapter, you remember that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And when he speaks to Nicodemus, he talks about the kingdom. Notice, if you will, in verse 3, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now look again in verse 5. In verse 5, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Notice he identifies his people as his kingdom. Then if you take your Bible, look, if you will, in the book of John and the 18th chapter. And as Jesus is standing before Pilate, notice what Jesus says about his kingdom. In John 18 and verse 36, he said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Jesus says it's a spiritual kingdom. He's trying to show the truth that it's not a worldly kingdom he's established, but a spiritual body. But then if you take your Bible, notice that he is the king. Look back in the book of John and the 12th chapter. As Jesus is entering into the city of Jerusalem, You remember the people gather around him. And notice they put down their garments and the palm trees as he is coming into the city. And notice as he rides on that donkey, what they're saying to him in verse 13. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now you look at that. He's the king. He's king of kings and lord of lords, John says in the Revelation letter. He is the one with all authority, absolute rule. So that far, I've looked at two pictures, and I see Christ as the head of the house. He is the head of the kingdom. But Paul gives us a third picture. In your Bible, in the book of Acts, in the 20th chapter, you remember that Paul talks about to the elders, the Ephesian elders on the island of Miletus, that they are to shepherd the flock. There and again you see another picture. The church, the kingdom, the people of God are identified as a flock. But now who is the one who's the overseer? Well, in the book of John and the 10th chapter, in verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is the one who oversees the sheep. So when I think about a shepherd, I think about someone who's protecting me and guiding me, directing me. And I need a shepherd. Sheep left to themselves, they would be lost and killed very quickly. They need someone to lead them and guide them and protect them. And what does Peter say in 1 Peter chapter 5? When he talks to the elders about how they're to rule, by example, not to lord over God's heritage, but to lead in a way they need to remember who they're following, the chief shepherd. Peter identifies Jesus as the chief shepherd, the one with all authority. Now, my friend, I recognize we don't hear that kind of preaching much anymore, but I'm fearful we're getting away from it too far. I think I need to re-examine myself and remember that I am part of the body. Christ is the head. That's what he said in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 that we read a moment ago. He's the head, we're the body. Colossians 1, 18 talks about Christ is the head of his body, as Brother Dean read just a few moments ago. So the truth then is Christ has all authority. He's the one who tells us how to worship, how to work, how to live. But that raises another question. How does he rule today? Since Jesus is in heaven, just how does he rule his kingdom, his people, his church on earth? Well, I believe the answer is found in the book of John and the 12th chapter. In the book of John and the 12th chapter, look, if you will, at verse 48. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Jesus said, I've left my word. 
Remember in the Hebrew letter and the first chapter and the first few verses, it says that God spoke in different ways and at different times in the gone, days gone by. But in these last days has spoken to us through his son. So Jesus has left us his word. If you take your Bible, you'll find that he gave the apostles authority. In the book of Acts, in the second chapter, in verse 42, it said they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Then if you take your Bible, look, if you will, in the book of Matthew, in the 18th chapter, when Jesus gives a command to the apostles. And notice the statement that he makes in verse 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So he had apostolic authority. Now, why did they have that? Because Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth and to bring to their remembrance all things Jesus said to them. They wouldn't have been able to do that had the Holy Spirit not guided them. Take your Bible and look in the book of John and the 14th chapter. In the book of John and the 14th chapter, look at verse 26. In verse 26, Jesus said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. So the Holy Spirit directed the apostles in what to say and what to write. So I have the revelation that God has given. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul is writing about the revelation. And notice what he says in verse 9. I has not seen nor hear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the thing of God except the spirit of God. So Paul makes a great statement in verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit is who's from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak. Not in man's wisdom. He says, but we understand that the teaching of the Holy Spirit, comparing spiritual things to spiritual. So when I look at my Bible, I understand this is the will of God revealed to man. And the individuals that broke these down in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 4 were able to confirm what they teaching was truth by miracles and signs. You also see that at the latter part of Mark 16. That when they taught, they were able to perform a miracle to confirm what they stated was true. Now, you know sometimes people today say that they, that they got some new truth. I always say, show me a miracle. No one could do that. They could to confirm the truth. But that brings up something else. I want you to think about they were told back in Matthew 28 and 18 to observe all things. And he says, you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. That means by the authority of each one. You baptize them for the remission of sin. And they're to observe, after you become a child of God, all things. What do we observe? We observe the breathed out message of God. We take his word, we apply his word, we follow his word, because he is the master. In 2 Timothy 3, 16, you remember that said that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means God breathed. When I take the Bible, the word of God, it's the breathed out message of God. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 27, they were told to read this epistle to the churches. And in 1 Timothy 4, 11, Paul instructed Timothy to command and teach what? What the Holy Spirit had revealed. You know, that's all I'm preaching today is what the Holy Spirit's revealed, going back to the Bible. Now, when they preached, they didn't have a Bible in their hand like I got. The Holy Spirit directly told them what to say, and they did so in their personality, but they wrote it down. I have to go back to what's already been confirmed by those who were able to perform the miracles and were guided by the Spirit of God. That brings up something else in our study. How do you interpret Scripture? If we're going to follow the Word of God, it's important we know how to interpret the Scripture. If you look in the Ephesian letter and the fifth chapter, you remember the Apostle Paul makes a statement in verse 17. He said, Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
You and I have a responsibility to understand the Word of God. So how do we interpret Scripture? To know what the will of the Lord is. Well, there's some basic principles. First, any interpretation that contradicts another passage is wrong. Uh, like some, they may say, faith only salvation. Well, that would contradict what James said in James 2.24 when he said it's not by faith alone, but by works. So you have to take all of Scripture. Secondly, we must remember who said or wrote it. And we remember who was reading it and for what purpose it was being said or written. But then we come down and some people call it a hermeneutic. I don't think it's a hermeneutic. I think it's communication. How does God communicate to us? And I think there's three ways. He, he can tell, show, or imply. And that's what he's done through Scripture. We often call that uh, commands, a divine approved examples, a necessary inference. But really, that's just communication. Now you say, I don't agree with you, preacher. Okay, I tell you what, disagree with me, but, but don't tell me anything, don't show me anything, and don't imply anything. You don't have anything. You've just eliminated communication. That's all we have. And so God has communicated us through giving direct commands. He's given us divine approved examples. And He's given us things that we necessarily infer. Now many times I recognize we struggle with some of those things. And I think that what we need to do is just go back to the Scripture and look at what is binding. In Acts 20 and verse 7, you remember the Bible says on the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. Now what's binding? They came together on the first day of the week to break bread. That means to partake of the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11. So the first day of the week's binding. Coming together's binding. And, 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 and being there every first day of the week's binding. But I'll tell you, what's not binding is what time we do it. We could do it first thing in the morning, late at night, just as long as it's the first day of the week. So there's some things that are permissible, and, but there's some things that are universally applied. There's some things, though, that we often have to be careful about. You know, we, there's some things that people can infer we need to be careful that we don't infer wrongly. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter and the apostles began to speak in tongues, they inferred from that that they were drunk. They weren't. Sometimes we have to be careful that it's a necessary inference. You remember in Acts 2, 38, they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now I take that and I look at Acts 8, and I see that the eunuch was baptized. What can I infer from Acts 2? His sins were blotted out. And you know what that would mean? Because in verse 38 it said he went on his way rejoicing. So here we have God communicating to his people. And I want to tell you something. Don't be ashamed to go back and look at how God communicates. And we've got to be careful with silence. Silence must be respected. Where God has not spoken, we don't just say, well, we're going to guess at that. Take your Bible and look in the book of Deuteronomy and the fifth chapter. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, this is the giving of the old law. And notice that the Lord gives the old law to Moses. And look at verse 22 carefully. These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly in the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added no more. That's sufficient. Moses wrote on the tablets what God said. God didn't add no more. Who is man to add where God has not directed? Moses told the people, God didn't give us any more. This is it. So when we have the word of God, we don't add to or take away. We're trying to follow who the head is. We're trying to follow our master. Can I say with all kindness and candor this morning, I think where we've missed it is we want to appeal to the world so badly. We want people converted, and that's great. But sometimes we almost go about it in a carnal way. And what we need to see is Jesus said, if they won't follow me because of who I am and what I've done, then any other way you can get them to follow me is not right. If they don't love me because I gave my life for them, because I'm the shepherd, because I'm the head of the house, because I'm the one who's loved them and redeemed them, if they don't love me for that, they won't love me if you give them all the money in the world. They'll love me for the wrong reason. And Jesus said, if they, 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 don't, they complain about how I tell them to worship, and they, they want to add this or add that, Jesus is saying, 
Who's the head? I'll tell you, Jesus is. Not the Pope, not the church, not the elders, not the preacher. No organization. Jesus is. And something I think I've learned is the older I get. Sometimes we just want simple answers, and when sometimes it's not always simple. And when men try to speak for the church, I'll tell you what you always end up with, a creed. And we've got to be careful that we don't have our creed. There's such a thing as an unwritten creed. Not all creeds are written down. What we need to do is make sure the Scripture is what we follow. The Word of God. Why? Because Jesus is the head of His church. I want to follow what He says. Question for you this morning. Are you following the authority of Christ? If you need to obey the gospel, we pray you come as together we stand and sing.